So today we are going to be wrapping up the re-gearing process of our GM eight and a quarter IFS all-wheel drive front differential. Uh, we got this job started last time, but progress was halted when I realized the spider gears in the center carrier here were actually wrong for an all-wheel drive application. One of the spider gears was missing a groove and that little retaining clip that's actually supposed to hold the passenger side axle into the housing, which is a fairly important job. So I just kind of put the brakes on things. I ordered a replacement set of spider gears from Yukon, which I don't know if they're necessarily stronger than stock, but they're at least brand new. And they also have both sides with a retaining clip and the corresponding groove that's machined into the spider gear. So now both of my stub axes will be properly retained into the housing. I think basically what happened is because this was a high mileage donor vehicle somewhere along the way, somebody had a bad bearing or whatever in the front differential and they figured instead of rebuilding it, let's just kind of replace it with a four wheel drive setup. And they just swapped the outer stub axle from the driver's or sorry, the passenger side onto the four wheel drive center section, which evidently worked enough to get the vehicle down the road, but that doesn't mean it was right. So anyway, uh, I got the Yukon spider gears in this morning and I've actually got a lot of progress made and I'll show you the footage in just a second, but we have the new spider gears installed into the carrier. I've got new carrier bearings pressed on. The ring gear is on. This is a 430 instead of a 373 that this housing used to have in it. And I even ran a pattern check, and now I know that we've got to get a little bit thicker pinion shim to push it just a little bit closer to the center of the differential right there. So um, that's kind of where I have left things off right now, but I'll show you the footage of how we got up to this point. So the actual assembly process of one of these IFS differentials is fairly straightforward. If you've taken it apart to this point, more than likely you can figure out how to get it back together. Really the tricky steps are just gonna be setting the backlash and setting the pinion depth. And then of course, after that, you still have to do the bearing preload, but that's fairly simple compared to the other two. 
Uh, but right now, where it sits, we have brand new everything inside the house. We've got the new Yukon Spider gears, and I don't know if they're necessarily stronger than stock, but it, at least it's brand new with zero miles on them, so it should be a little bit tighter than it was before. Of course, all new bearings, and it will have all new seals by the time we're done. So we've got, or we will have, rather, a completely refreshed differential that should be good to hold up to quite a bit of horsepower because you know there's a lot of drag racers out there that use four-wheel drive when they're going down the strip and they put a lot more power through these axles than i'm gonna have at first um, and they've held up really good even though it is only like an eight and a quarter inch ring gear uh, so anyway the very first thing that i checked was the backlash and normally what you do on an axle like this is you just put the dial indicator on the tip of the ring gear kind of at a 90 degree angle and you just wiggle it back and forth until you hear the play and you look at the reading on the indicator and that's your backlash uh, spec for this one is six to ten thousandths of an inch same as the uh, 8.6 10 bolt out back so that's it's kind of a similar spec but the only problem is you actually can't read this the same way that you can on a differential with the banjo cover that comes off the back because it's in this big clamshell all put together. There's really no way to get a good dial indicator in through that little access point. Uh, and even if you could get one through here, it's at a it's perpendicular rather than uh, coplanar to the uh, radius of the gear. I think that's I don't know if I'm saying that right or not, but anyway, um, what the factory service manual recommends that you do is instead of putting the dial indicator on the ring gear is putting it on the tip of the pinion yoke. Same thing at a 90 degree angle to it and they just kind of wiggle it back and forth. Uh, what I did to kind of make sure nothing moved around because you do need to get a really precise reading is I had the center section clamped to the table and then through that little access hole right there, I was able to jam uh, this, which is just like a Home Depot paint stirrer for a five gallon bucket and it's got a ruler on there, but it's just the perfect thickness to kind of jam through that access point and in between the tip of the ring gear and the housing. So it'll kind of hold it still and then you can just kind of wiggle the uh, pinion yoke back and forth and that's how you take your reading. But the only caveat is the reading that you obtain here is not the actual backlash. You have to divide it by two. So I think I had about 16 thousandths of an inch backlash as measured on the pinion yoke, but it's actually eight thousandths of backlash if you were able to measure it on the tip of the ring gear like you normally should. So uh, I've actually seen two different ways of doing that. One says multiply by 0.5, which is dividing by half, and the other says multiply by 0.7, which is a little bit more than half. But um, my sort of sanity check is just kind of to wiggle the ring gear because you can get to that through that big plug in the side. Wiggle the ring gear and just kind of feel and listen for it because if you've done a couple of these rear ends, you can usually by feel get pretty darn close to the correct backlash. So as long as it feels right and if you measure and you kind of divide by half and you get within the same, if the two measurements kind of agree with each other, basically what I'm trying to say is that should be right. Uh, anyway, the next thing that I need to talk about is dialing in the pattern. And I know we just did a re-gearing video for the back axle a little while ago, but I didn't talk about what you change to shift the pattern around. So where we're at right now is you can see this is the drive side of the gear. And my pattern is flat across the top, if that'll focus, and kind of rounded on the bottom, which basically looks like this guy right here. So flat across the top, around it on the bottom, which means I need to push that pattern a little bit deeper into the gear. And you do that by, or on this axle particularly, you do that by adding a thicker shim in between the head of the pinion and the big bearing. So I started out with a factory shim at 29,000 because you've got to start somewhere and usually the factory shim will at least get you in the ballpark. But uh, it's not perfect, so I'm going to increase it to probably 35 thousandths, put everything back together, run another pattern check, and hopefully we'll be a little bit closer.
So I had a hard time reading the gear pattern when we installed the 430s in the rear 10 bolt, but I think that was because it was a used set of gears. I had them in my other truck for a couple thousand miles and evidently a used set has a hard time imprinting or whatever the process is. But luckily on these gears up front in the IFS, it's making a nice and crisp clean pattern so I can really, really get a good read on where the gears are kind of meshing together. Uh, we made a total shim change of eight thousandths of an inch going from 37, uh, sorry, 29 to 37, so eight thousandths deeper on the pinion depth, and it's a definite step in the right direction, although I think I am going to take it just a little bit further. Um, so you can kind of see where the gears are touching on the drive side right there, and with a little bit of light, you can really, really read the gear pattern. Uh, on the top edge, it definitely is a little bit straighter than it is on the bottom, and the pattern is favoring the top side of the gear just a little bit. Um, so I am gonna try to push that just a little bit deeper. I'll show you the coast side over here. Um, and that, it is kind of straight on top and bottom. So I don't have quite as good of a pattern on the coast side, but on the drive side, uh, the way I interpret that, I definitely wanna go just a little bit deeper, but certainly not quite as much as we went before. So I think this time I'm gonna go three more thousands. I'll take it to an even 40. We'll put it back together. We'll run a pattern check and maybe we'll get lucky and this will be our final iteration. I tried several different thicknesses of pinion shim and the one that made the pattern I was actually the happiest with was the second one I tried, 37 thousandths of an inch. Anytime I went a little bit thicker, the pattern just kind of skewed definitely towards the too deep where the bottom was like really, really flat and the top was kind of rounded. Um, and any narrower or thinner rather than 37 kind of did the opposite. So uh, 37 is where I'm gonna run it. Last time I showed you, I had the drive and the coast side mixed up. This is actually a reverse rotation pinion on the front. Uh, but anyhow, that is the drive side over here. And if I can zoom in just a little bit and focus, that's the wear pattern. Uh, and like I said, that's as close as I was able to get to a consistent line on top and bottom. And then on the coast side over here, that's kind of what we're going to be working with. Like I said, I played around with it. And anytime I went shallower or deeper on the pinion depth, I just really wasn't happy with the pattern. That's as good as it looks. So that's where we're going to send it. From now, what I've got to do is pull the pinion gear out. I have to press on my permanent bearings. And then I have to install the crush collar and set the pinion bearing preload. Also install the pinion seal. And then we can assemble the two halves of the case together for good.
So we're pretty much wrapped up with all the difficult parts when it comes to re-gearing or rebuilding this eight and a quarter IFS. Uh, now, one question that came up in the comments quite a bit after I posted the last video was why didn't I put any sort of a limited slip differential inside this axle? And the reason of that is pretty simple, actually. It's because nobody even makes any sort of a limited slip or a locker for these eight and a quarter IFS setups. I believe somebody does make a locker for the nine and a quarter that's in like the 2500 HD trucks, but in the Silverado 1500s, there is no limited slip that's available. But uh, everything that I've read actually suggests that if you're doing any sort of a drag racing and you have like a locker or a limited slip up front in a four wheel drive vehicle, a lot of people seem to think that would cause problems. They would even cause the truck to kind of want to steer itself into the wall, which we definitely don't want that to happen. But uh, I think it would be cool to have some sort of a limited slip, especially if we want to do like some four wheel drive donuts, which we are definitely going to try uh, once we get this truck all wheel drive converted. But anyway, um, yeah, there's just no limited slip available. So the last critical step to getting this thing set up is the carrier bearing preload. That's just how much tension on the two bearings kind of pushing together. And you set that by turning these little side adjusters here. This is like a nut that kind of threads in and out and that pushes on the bearing race. Um, you do have to have some sort of a tool. I made my own. This is just quarter plate welded into an old cheap socket I had laying around and basically just kind of goes into those little tabs kind of like that and it lets you torque them down. Uh, the settings that I found online, I think, are from a factory GM service manual. And what that kind of said to do was tighten the side adjusters to 55 pound feet and then continue to tighten them until you achieve between 30 and 55 inch pounds of rotation on the pinion. So that's the combined rotational drag of the pinion bearing preload and the carrier bearing preload also. So what I did is I started out by torquing them about 55 pound feet and then just kind of had to get them so the little lock tab would actually still line up in between those two bumps because that's what will hold this all from backing out is when you just hammer that down. Uh, so anyway, I got it to 55 pound feet. I checked it and I was at like 26 or 27 inch pounds of rotation. And then because that's a little bit low, I tried to go to the next notch tight but that turned out to be like way, way too tight. So I'm just kind of staying on the loose side of spec, but just to put that in perspective, um, that's still quite a bit of preload from like what I would call like zero lash. So when I put it together, I just kind of finger tight, turned the side adjusters until it touched and I checked my backlash there. Um, so to get it to 55 foot pounds and then where I'm at now, it is still a fair amount of preload on those bearings, but maybe not just enough, but the next notch, like I said, it's too tight. So anyway, um, I did double check backlash at the end because when you tighten those side adjusters, if you don't go evenly, they could throw your backlash out. And our final reading is on the yoke, go that way, 12 thousandths of an inch. But you've got to remember that when you measure on the yoke, that's not ring gear backlash. You cut that in half. So we are actually six thousandths of an inch ring gear backlash. And I got those two paint sticks just kind of jammed in there to stop the ring gear from turning while I take my measurement here. So basically this differential is 100% set up and all we've got to do now is just tap down these little side adjuster locks so those guys don't back out. Put a seal on that side, you know, put the vent plug in, the drain and fill plugs, and then of course glue on the far side axle tube. And this diff rebuild is done and it's stronger than before because we now have brand new spider gears, but we also have a spider gear that'll actually hold that stub axle into the housing. So I do want to say thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. Do me the favor though, like the video, comment and subscribe if you don't mind. That helps everything grow in the algorithm and all that good stuff. Uh, so next time I think we're going to be working on the step side once again. I'll get my fuel pump in and all the wiring associated with it. Then we can finally throw the bed back on this truck and see how it looks with our new lower ride height.